Welcome to another round of Drawing Board or Miro Board. Today we discuss technical diagramming with systems architect Maya. Let's go. First question. You've spent ten hours slogging over a sequence diagram that should have taken five. Drawing Board or Miro Board? Drawing Board. And if I'm being honest, Miro would probably cut that time down by half. You know, with its AI tools and ready-to-go templates. Next, your diagrams become so bulky, it's more complex than the solar system. But all it takes is a few clicks and... It's Miro. I've used those technical shape packs way too many times. And stuff is just digestible on its infinite online canvas. Now, the final question. Everyone's brought in. But you have to make all these tasks all the way over in Jira. But wait, it's done. Is it... Miro, easy with its two-way Jira sync. Easy to plot dependencies. Everyone always knows what's up. And she's done it. Join over 60 million people creating technical diagrams without workflow glitches. Get your first three boards for free at Miro.com. That's M-I-R-O.com. It's June 21st, 1791, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. So it was on this day that the British Board of Ordnance, which uh, sounds like something from Harry Potter, but was in fact a (laughs) government-funded mapping agency, bought themselves a theodolite which is, uh, fact fans, a precision (laughs) optical instrument for measuring angles between designated visible points. And it was thereby, with the purchase of this instrument, that they were then able to undertake the task of mapping all of Britain in glorious detail, a project and an organisation that then became known as the Ordnance Survey. And my God, it was an enormous project. Because of the scale at which they were trying to map, or rather the Mm. detail that they were trying to do it at, it took them 20 years just to do the County of Kent, with Essex following shortly after that. And it took another 20 years to do the bottom of England, including England and Wales. And you'll notice there's a bit of a pattern there, which is they were concentrating on the south coast first because a lot of the history of mapping is based around military concerns and the Mm. main concern at the Mm. time was France. So it made sense that they were starting with those vulnerable points. The whole concept of mapping the country was started as a result of the Jacobite Rebellion in the 1740s where the English forces were hampered by the fact that they didn't really know what was in the highlands. And so afterwards, senior British army officers commissioned a team under a a brilliant guy called William Roy to start mapping Scotland. And then later on in the 1780s, Roy was selected to lead the English side of the Anglo-French survey, which was basically the Greenwich and Paris observatories had developed a bit of a... Well, according to our calculations, this is here. Well, according to ours, it's there. (laughs) And they decided to settle it by mapping their relative positions to one another and then comparing their measurements of longitude and latitude. So then they used a technique called triangulation, which I don't understand that well. No, I don't understand how just because you can put some land in a triangle, you can map it. What? Don't get it. (laughs) But I do know that Roy was using his eye to make some of those maps like Mm. he's still you know widely credited as the first great cartographer from britain but actually it was this purchase of the theodolite that made it a kind of more scientific endeavor he fits into that early group of gung-ho science nerds you know like early (laughs) botanists who were like i'm really interested in flowers and i can draw them really Mm. well and i'm also willing to go on a big boat and (laughs) and go to the new world and subject myself to all of the rigors and pressures and possible death that lies out there and he was the same he was like this sort of army guy gung-ho walk for miles but also have this incredible maths brain well i suppose he thought he was doing it for his country i mean that's the thing isn't it and i didn't really understand until i looked into this really that that connection between the army and mapping Mm. had always been there partly for the reason that rebecca has already credited which is you know it was important to have maps to work out where the enemy might invade or where a discontent scotland might march into england Mm -hmm. but also right the way through to the 20th century until the 1960s all the director generals of the ordnance survey as an organization held an army rank Mm. and you know in the event of a major war obviously the last one of those was 1945, Ordnance Survey would limit its civilian activities and concentrate on their military work. That was the role of Ordnance Survey. Yes, make fun maps for tourists, but also let's make sure we don't get attacked by the French. Yeah, and they'd send surveyors to the front line to actually take part in the working out of topography and and mapping the ground so that they could fire more accurate projectiles and so on. It's astonishing. They were also very expensive, Rebecca. I don't know if you've seen, but (laughs) the original maps 
You'd buy a fragment, obviously, rather than the whole country. But to buy a fragment of an Ordnance Survey map when they were all handwritten and then printed off expensive templates and stuff was the equivalent of about two weeks' wages. You know, you should think of it now, it's like something that costs like four quid and you fold up and put in your pocket, or an app that you pay two pounds for. But two weeks' wages to have a map. But it was considered really a desirable item to be able to see... From above, it was a perspective that only hot air balloonists has ever had before. (laughs) Well, it must have been pretty incredible to know that, obviously, they'd been mapped since forever, but this was the first time you had a scientifically accurate portrayal of what was around you. It must have been quite exciting. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, you're absolutely right that now you can buy these things for a fraction of the price. And in fact, the Ordnance Survey now has its own merch shop at which you can buy a picnic blanket of Snowdonia for just 40 quid. That's great value. <laughs> you can get towels of London for twenty four ninety nine and Ben Nevis micro towels for nine ninety nine. That's a bit unfair to Ben Nevis. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're tackling old Ben Nevis, I guess you want a micro towel rather than the whole beachside experience. Um, but yeah, you know, much cheaper than the than the prices of ye oldie maps. Well, I've got one actually framed on my wall downstairs. I do. It's interesting to read that they were originally considered works of art because. I don't even like maps in the sense that, like, I'm dyspraxic, so I find it really hard to follow maps. Like, Google Maps was incredible for me, like someone just telling me which way to go. (laughs) But I do think they're beautiful on the wall, and I've got one of those personalised maps that my mother-in-law got me for a Christmas present one year. So it says Ollie's map in the corner rather than, you know, my postcode. But it is basically just a map printed to my postcode. And it's really useful because sometimes having a visual representation of what to do that weekend, you can look up and you can say, oh, look, there's a big patch of green over there in the northeast yeah. what's that we yeah. haven't been to that bit and then you can look it up it's funny how maps have sort of ceased to be relevant now that we do live in the era of google maps and so they've become an art object or they've become a kind of a thing that you might mm. s- just stare at in in idle moments but it's not so very long ago that they had a real world application when i started driving there was right. no sat nav and i had to pull over and have an argument with my girlfriend about where we were <laughs> i think that was the primary purpose of maps to cause and then <laughs> after a long time resolve arguments between couples to ensure all dyspraxics were single. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the Ordnance Survey maps enabled us to know a terrific amount in extreme detail about what's on the ground in every town, city, hamlet, scrap of countryside in the UK. Mm-hmm. So I've got a couple of facts and then I've got a quiz question. Mm-hmm. Love it. Outside of London, Norfolk has the most museums in the land with 54. Mm-hmm. And West Sussex is the county with the largest area of commercial greenhouses, 215 hectares. Did we need right. mapping people to tell us these things? <laughs> Just count the museums already. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find where the highest pub in Britain was? Is it that one in the Lake District? It's in Richmond, Yorkshire, actually. It is the Tan Hill Inn at 520 metres high. Do you get drunk quicker? (laughs) Well, they do live music nights and you can buy merchandise saying, I've been to Britain's highest gig. So that sort of has a double meaning, doesn't it, in a way. (laughs) Uh, But I've been on their website and uh, they promise a warm meeting place known internationally where walkers and cyclists brush shoulders with bohemian like-minded individuals. (laughs) Doesn't sound like many pubs in Richmond, does it? But I'm intrigued now. I think if ever we do a face-to-face recording, it should be at the highest pub in Britain. (laughs) For sure. (laughs) But the quiz question, Rebecca, Mm. were you going to quiz us? Yes. Picture the island of Great Britain. Got Got it. it. Yep. So far, so good. According to you guys' conception of this country... Yeah. Oh, no. It's going to be how many miles of coastline there no, is. No, no, don't it? worry. I, I hate miles questions. Yeah, so you, so don't you worry. Can't it won't get it right, be can you? It's oh, yeah, to the nearest metre. How tall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The centre of Britain is in what county? Staffordshire. Okay, Marion. Is the Cotswolds a county? It's also the wrong one, but... <laughs> that's definitely <laughs> the wrong one. Well, hold on, no, no, but I, know, I was thinking England. Centre of Britain exactly. is going to be further Britain. north, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Derbyshire is that north of Staffordshire I'm going to say Derbyshire okay. Glasgowshire <laughs> <laughs> do you know what Arian I think you've come in at a disadvantage and, and it shows and that's on me it's my only chance to win the correct answer is Lancashire oh well close enough you know, north. <laughs> no, I think surely yeah, yeah. Not, not too bad 
I actually made me laugh because apparently the most common question that the ordnance survey get asked is, what is the centre of Britain? No way. Uh, and the answer that their press spokesperson gave the Telegraph, which I admire deeply, is, the truth is there can be no absolute centre for a three-dimensional landmass sitting on the surface of a sphere and surrounded by the ebb and flow of seawater. <laughs> <laughs> That's marvellous. But if you insist, it's, it's great, Lancashire. And all credit to the Telegraph for printing it as well, because I bet if they'd given that exact answer to the mirror, they would not have printed that. <laughs> uh, maybe laugh. So good. And so another week of retrospecting ends. But next week begins a day early at Club Retrospectors. Join us now to get an exclusive episode every Sunday. Patreon.com slash retrospectors.